Yeah, th thanks very much. It's uh, it's lovely to be able to to share um, to share these ideas uh, uh, with you today. Um, so um, uh, so the story that I'll tell is about intersection theory on the moduli space of curves uh, and and some directions in this that that I've been exploring with uh, with Sam Mulho uh, and and some other people who I'll mention maybe towards the end. Um, and uh, and it starts by uh, by thinking about uh, cycles on the moduli space of, uh, of, of curves that are uh, associated to constructions of line bundles, right? So um, MGN for me is, uh, so we'll start here, it's just the, the moduli space of genus G curves, smooth genus G curves with N marked points, uh, distinct markings. Uh, and there are essentially two, um, what I might call universal ways of constructing line bundles on curves, uh, given, given this data. So given a point uh, in this moduli space, I get some object that looks like uh, um, a genus G curve with n mark points. And there are essentially two ways of, of naming line bundles that are independent of the particular geometry of, of, of the curve. Uh, one of them is just a cotangent bundle. So I can take omega C and maybe tensor, take tensor powers of it. Uh, so that's one family of line bundles. Uh, and another is, well, because I'm, I'm actually on MGN and I have these n mark points, I can take linear combinations of the marked points. Right? So the, those also give me uh, line bundles. So these are two universal uh, ways. And when I say universal, I mean that, okay, in, in some precise sense uh, that, that's related to something called the Franchetta conjecture, these are really the only two uh, ways of constructing line bundles uh, in, in, uh, in the moduli space of curves, uh, on curves, uh, sorry, line bundles on curves. Um, uh, and so, so both of these give you maps from MGN to its universal Picard variety. So, so over, the over the moduli space of curves is a universal curve. Uh, whose fiber over uh, over a point in MGN is that curve, uh, and I can uh, if I, if I want to associate to every um, to every object in MGN a line bundle on that curve, well I can use combinations of these two uh, these two constructions. Okay, so these are really the only two ways um, to construct maps from MGN to its universal Picard variety. Uh, and and the double ramification cycle, which is uh, sort of the heart of of what I'll be discussing, uh, comes from asking yourself. Uh, to what extent do these two constructions uh, overlap, or when do they overlap? Right. So, so to maybe to be a little bit more precise, I'll fix uh, I'll fix a vector, uh, a one up to a n of integers, and I'll assume that the sum is zero. Okay. Uh, and uh, what I want to study is this uh, this subset uh, d r g of a, which I'll I'll call the double ramification uh, cycle with uh, with input vector a. Uh, and it's just the set of, uh, of, of curves such that this line bundle, sum of AIPI specified by uh, these uh, n integers, uh, is trivial. Okay, so that's that's the that's the subset. So it's 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 a condition on uh, points in MGN, namely that this line bundle is actually just the trivial line bundle. Uh, so just to uh, to make this into a really concrete uh, thing, we can we can take the perspective that's that's often offered by a, a gromov witten theory, uh, where I have a curve. And given these numbers, a1 up to a, and what I'm really asking for is, does this curve admit a rational function? Does it admit a map to p1 such that the uh, the zeros and poles uh, of this uh, of this function occur precisely at the mark points p1 up to pn, and the orders are measured by these ais? Okay, so this is just a, a collection of uh, of integers that are now the positive ones are measuring maybe the order of the zero, the negative ones are measuring the order of the pole. Uh, okay, so this is a very simple uh, this is a very simple cycle. Uh, if you think about it for a little while, you can convince yourself can convince yourself using just the basic geometry of uh, uh, of algebraic curves that this should be a co-dimension G subset uh, in uh, in MGN. All right. So this this uh, DRG is a co-dimension G subset of MGN. Um, uh, so so I should say that that this is uh, somehow uh, one uh, one this is one version of a construction. You can twist it up in various different ways. Uh, so, for instance, maybe you want to know that the sum of AIPI for some other integers is a power if some is some fixed power of omega. Uh, maybe you vary the the problem by studying not the moduli space of curves, but some other moduli problem where there's some other natural line bundle floating around. Uh, but 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 this gives the basic sense of what's going on here, right? So I'm constructing cycles on the moduli space of curves by asking when these two line bundle constructions uh, agree. Uh, okay, so I'll say something more about the, these other versions later on. Um, okay, so so these are the double ramification cycles. This is this is the double ramification cycle on MGN. Um, I'll be interested in in compactifications of this cycle. Okay, so I'm namely extensions uh, of this DRG naught to cycles on MGN bar. Uh, and there are essentially two ways these days. It took some time to understand this well. 
uh, there, there are two ways to, uh, to, to kind of get at these, uh, these compactifications. Uh, so one, so the perspective I'll take is, is via gromov witten theory, but that's mostly because that's just my upbringing. Um, and the basic idea is to, is to, is to look at this, um, uh, at this picture here, uh, thinking that, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I want to, I want to examine curves that admit a map to P1 of a certain, a certain type that's, that's fixed by my, uh, my, my discrete data. Uh, and I'll compactify it by studying um, by studying maps from nodal curves, not to P1, but to nodal P1s. Okay, so maybe this, the, the, hopefully, this is some somewhat intuitive. As the curve breaks, maybe you want the target to also break. Okay, so this is this is quite a natural idea uh, in um, uh, yeah, okay, in lots of contexts. Uh, okay, so so let me just say what it is. Um, so uh, I'm still fixing this discrete data A. It's just a vector of integers whose sum is zero. Uh, and I'm going to study uh, those curves, those points in MGN uh, bar. So it's a, it's a nodal curve uh, that had been a map not to P1, but to a union of two copies of P1 that are kind of joined at this uh, at this node. Uh, and uh, there's this ramification condition. So there are some positive entries here, and maybe that uh, uh, you know, so so that tells me what what should be happening uh, to this uh, to this map uh, over this distinguished leftmost point, which I'll think of as zero. Okay, so I'll call this zero. And there's a distinguished rightmost point, which I'll call infinity. Uh, and uh, and the, the again the preimage of zero is, uh, is 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 precisely the points that have uh, where the associated uh, where the associated number ai is positive uh, and the order of vanishing is exactly the that number okay, and similarly over infinity I have exactly those mark points where the associated ai is negative and I have exactly that uh, ai as my uh, order of pull there okay so these are the kinds of maps that I want to study there's an additional technical condition that that's that's very important uh, which is that um, uh, I want these nodes here, when they map to a node downstairs, to actually uh, have a well-defined ramification order. I'm not constraining it, uh, but I need, uh, so if you like, when I break this map into two maps, right? so if I break this map to P1 union P1 into, uh, P1, sorry, join P1 into uh, a, a map from two different curves to a disjoint union of two, uh, two P1s, the, the ramification order at this node should be well-defined. Okay? So this is a technical condition. If you've seen it before, that's great. If you haven't seen it before, this is just the right thing to do. Um, uh, and you can ask me later about why. Uh, okay, so so um, what does this do? Ultimately, it produces a subset of um, a certain subset of of, uh, of the moduli space of curves, which is called this double ramification cycle. Right? So it's just um, okay, if 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 uh, if you want to upload one thing into your brain, it's just this it's the cycle of curves in MGN bar that admit uh, maps to broken P1s, unions of P1s uh, of a certain um, uh, with, with certain specified uh, discrete data. And, and via gromov witten theory, it actually defines a, a cohomology class on the moduli space of curves, and that's called the double ramification cycle. Okay, so this is a, um, uh, yeah, okay. So, so this, this, uh, this class lives in the co-dimension G part of the cohomology of the moduli space of curves. Okay, so maybe I'll pause there and ask if there are any, and this, is, this is really the central construction. So maybe I should pause and ask if there are any questions about it. Okay, good. Um, all right, so so um, I I want to say a word for those of you who have seen a little bit of gromov witten theory, and and after that I'll basically ignore this uh, this direction. Uh, uh, there there's something of a roadmap of how you know people got interested in this uh, in this in this cycle in the first place, and the and the basic roadmap is that so so gromov witten theory is essentially concerned with fixing some kind of let's say projective manifold. Uh, and studying curves inside that projective manifold and extracting some numbers in some very complicated way that I won't say anything about, but, but basically it's about curves in X. Uh, and that's quite a hard thing to study. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool, essentially, uh, although it's interesting uh, for independent reasons, uh, people started, uh, began to study what's called relative gromov witten theory, theory, where rather than just studying curves in X, you study curves in X, but you fix some tangency conditions along a boundary divisor, right? So rather than conics in P2, you think about conics in P2 that are tangent to a fixed line, uh, right? So, so that's, uh, that, that, that's the kind of modified, uh, the, the kind of modified problem. And the, um, the, the relative gromov witten theory somehow has, has been one of the major tools in the study of, 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 of the gromov witten theory of, 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 of ordinary gromov witten theory of projective uh, manifolds. Um, the double ramification cycles are in some sense the local contribution of in, in this in this kind of newer relative gromov witten theory uh, that the, the local contribution that happens essentially near the near the divisor okay so so um, the the way this typically works uh, one wants to study um, uh, yeah so so one wants to study uh, curves in projective bundles and p1 bundles over 
over the divisor, and that and that's roughly what we're we're actually doing. So the double ramification cycle that I built for you is somehow the the main contribution to this story in the case where this divisor is a point and the manifold is a curve. Okay, so so it's really the, a, a very a very um, elementary part of of this larger story, but it turns out that all the complexity really lies here. Right? So. Uh, so that so that's just an aside for for where this stuff uh, comes up. So people have been interested in this uh, in this cycle for a very long time. So it's a uh, so as I said, it, it you know this 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 uh, it, it's just code. This is a very natural code dimension G class on the moduli space of curves. Um, and and there are maybe you know in the last people have been interested in this for about twenty years now. Uh, so I think the the first really significant thing is that uh, the the definition that I gave you. Uh, really only makes sense uh, because of some work of Jun Lee on on um, yeah on this in the, developing the subject of relative Gromov in theory and algebraic geometry, uh, and then really the first um, interesting result about uh, about the cycle is that it lies in the in what's called the tautological part of the cohomology ring of the moduli space of curves. So I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about what this tautological ring actually is and how you might think about it. Maybe you've seen uh, things about it before, in which case um, yeah, good for you. Um, uh, so it also started to play a very important role in this. Uh, so it, it played an important role in this work of Graeber and Bakhiel uh, that constrains uh, just the intersection theory on MGN bar. So it tells you something. You know, just understanding the structure of this cycle doesn't just tell you about, you know, what you know. It doesn't just tell you about the, the cycle itself, but but it, it constrains the, the topology of MGN bar in quite an interesting, uh, interesting way. And then it was Eli Ashberg's problem. Uh, to understand, uh, just to, to essentially just give a formula for this class. Okay. So this is a co-dimension G class. We should be able to write it down in terms of known, uh, uh, you know, known classes on on MGN bar. That was the question, uh, and that question was solved after a long time. So in, in two that this is roughly 2016. There's this incredible work based on a, a ridiculous guess of Aaron Pixton for what the formula for this cycle should be. Uh, and once the guess was made, these uh, these folks, uh, Yanda, Pandari, Pande, Pixton, and Zvonkin just proved it. Okay, uh, so that that went and had a lot of uh, important um, uh, implications for our subject. And one of them was the development of this logarithmic Abel Jacobi theory, which which maybe I'll say a little bit more about later on. Uh, okay, so that's roughly the story. Uh, and and the situation in maybe 2016 was was uh, looked fairly definitive. So so there's this natural cycle on the moduli space of curves. It's constructed using this fairly elementary uh, view of the geometry. And there's just a formula for what that cycle is in terms of things we understand very well. And that's it. Story over. Uh, and um, yeah, okay. So so this all happened before I I knew any of this. Uh, and and my my personal entry point into this subject was. Um, was to think about a variation. So, so there were some signs maybe in around 2017, 2018 that that actually maybe that answer that was given um, this very nice answer given by by Pixton and friends was not all that definitive. Uh, so, so in, in order to explain why, um, uh, the, here, here's the problem I want to consider. So, so um, okay, just to rewind and go back to my old picture. Uh, in, in at least uh, to first approximation, all we did here was say, okay, in in I want to study curves that admit a map of a certain type, so so that defines a subset of MGN, um, and and I just want to study curves that admit a map to P1 of a certain type, and so you can ask, you know, what, what is so special about about P1, right? So so why not curves that admit a map to a surface of some certain type? And maybe the simplest one to do, and and this will, I'll, I'll choose this example because it helps me make my point. Um, uh, you can also think about maps to P1 cross P1. Right? So, so that's that's also relatively natural. So how would you do that? Well, basically in a similar way. So, uh, so you can think about maps to the surface P1 cross P1 from a genus G curve. Um, and now you don't just get to, uh, to ask whether, um, whether a, a function vanishes uh, or doesn't vanish. You get to do that in two different ways because there's two coordinates on the P1 cross P1. So for each of the projections, uh, you can ask for the, for the map to be um, to, to ramify it. So, so, so maybe if I project onto this factor, I get a map to P1, and you can ask, what is the order of vanishing of this point here, and what is the order of vanishing of that point there? Okay, so this is, I mean, th there, there's nothing all that complicated about this. So I'm, I'm going to give this a name, and this is this uh, toric contact cycle, and you can ask it more generally for, for any toric variety, really, for, for, for almost anything. What is the locus in MGN, or what is the locus in MGN bar of curves that parameterizes, that parameterize 
curves that admit a map to say P1 cross P1 of some fixed type, right? Fixed degree and, and ramification data um, in this way. Okay, so it's just a kind of curious way of building cycles on MGN bar. Uh, and and maybe you know you, you know if, if if you're like me you know you you like this story and you want to under you you want to find some version of the story that is uh, that, that that you can say something about and so so that's how we that that that's how I started thinking about this question, um, but actually at first sight um, you know if if you're you know, if I stopped the talk here and then you went I don't know you 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 went home or you're at home you make some tea or something you'll you'll think actually that this is not so interesting like whatever this guy is saying can't be all that interesting because. Ultimately, what it means to study, what does it mean to, to admit a map to P1 cross P1? Well, you have to admit one map to P1 and you have to admit another map to P1. Uh, and so, um, so actually, at least, at least on smooth curves, this is a pretty boring question, right? So, so this toric contact cycle, which for me, again, uh, is just the locus of curves and the, the locus of points in MGN uh, the parameterized curves that admit a fixed map to P1 cross P1, and the discrete data is given by now two vectors instead of just one vector. It's just the intersection of these two double ramification cycles, which I already told you I understand extremely well, right? And it, I understand them well in the sense that I understand them well in a ring. And so, uh, you know, if I understand two things well in the cohomology ring, then I should understand how to intersect them. I just take the product and there you have it. You know, you have a formula for this and what more could you want? Um, okay, so at least on the interior, this is true. On MGN, this is true, uh, but somehow this actually turns out to fail on MGN bar, and this was some of the first sign that there was something more complicated going on here than 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 we had initially thought. Okay, so um, so okay, so what fails? Uh, what fails is that there is this cycle which I'll call yeah the toric contact cycle associated to to this discrete data a1 a2, which are these two vectors, and morally this is some compactification of of curves that it admit a map to P1 cross P1 of a fixed type. So just in the same way as before, uh, the, the definition of the cycle is somewhat subtle. One has to pass through logarithmic or Witten theory in order to do it. Um, but, but what you found is that whatever this thing is, you know, you have to, okay, th th there's some question of, you know, did I pick the co correct thing on the left? But there's other ways to verify that. So there's a cycle now of co-dimension 2G because I want two functions on a curve and that's 2G conditions. Uh, and it's not equal to the product Whereas it is equal to the product of two double ramification cycles on the interior. Okay, so and this is somehow the puzzle. So, so to understand exactly what was going on here uh, was uh, was maybe the main motivation to do this. Uh, okay, so uh, let me pause for a second and just say a word about uh, what this thing on the left is because it okay it's 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 vaguely speaking the main uh, object of this talk. So so I should at least half define it. Um, so but the definition is not so different than before. So so let me go back. Um, so for double ramification cycles, the idea was on the interior, look at those curves that emit a map to P1 with some discrete data, with some fixed discrete data, uh, determining what that map should look like. And I compactified it by saying, well, if the curve breaks, so should the target. Okay. And you, you, you impose the condition and somehow the, the only way that if you were, yeah, if you were left somewhere with this problem, this is what you would come up with. Uh, and, um, uh, and we're gonna do the same thing here, but it's just a little bit more subtle to control exactly what this means. So, so um, so rather than, um, you know, when the curve breaks, rather than just admitting a map to uh, something like P1 cross P1, you have to uh, admit a map to something called a broken toric surface. Okay, so an example of which I've drawn over here, maybe each of these pictures uh, is a copy of P1 cross P1. They're glued along boundary in the way that uh, probably many of you have seen in other contexts. Uh, and the curve is broken, but the curve has to fit inside that boundary in the expected way. So maybe every component of the curve maps to a component of the target, uh, to an ir irreducible component of the target, um, where the nodes of the curve, you know, the 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 uh, yeah the, the breakage point of the of the target kind of coincides with the breakage point of the curve, and there are some conditions about how the ramification points have to the, the ramification orders have to match up. Okay, so there are some technical conditions. The the, the this is somehow precisely what logarithmic Kramer Witten theory is, and that's a whole talk on its own. And so I I will I will not say much more about this. Okay. Uh, but 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 log Kramer Witten theory gives us a natural way to compactify this cycle. Uh, okay, uh, so I should say that, that this is, uh, so, so uh, this, the, the, the fact that this product formula fails from this Gromov Witten perspective is, is, is something that I, I noticed uh, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and around the same time, uh, also um, David Holmes, Aaron Pixton, and, and Johannes Schmidt uh, came across the same thing, but from a more kind of Abel Jacobi point of view, um, which, uh, which is a kind of parallel thread running through this story. Okay. 
But because of this failure of product formula, a lot of simple questions that 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 ought to be known if this product formula held are actually uh, were okay are actually still open. Some of them uh, some of them settled, but but uh, at least at this point in in the story they were open. Uh, and so, uh, so the simplest one is, you know, where, where in cohomology does this class live? It's a codimension 2G class. So can you say that it lives in any particular part of the cohomology ring of the moduli space of curves? So, so for those of you who have never thought about this before, the cohomology ring of the moduli space of curves, the Chow ring of the moduli space of curves is some crazy beast that we will probably never fully understand, right? So it's, it's kind of infinitely generated and, you know, there, there's no, you know, we, we will probably never have a basis or a spanning set for it or anything like that, right? So it's, it's a completely crazy part of the, uh, it's a completely crazy ring. There is a subring inside of it. And I'll, again, I'll say a little bit more about this as we keep going. There's a subring inside of it that people like to call the tautological ring that in some sense contains all the classes that you can name without too much effort, okay? So, so if you're familiar with say something like Schubert calculus, uh, there are classes on the, in the cohomology of the Grassmannian that you can name just by the fact that it's the Grassmannian. Maybe there's a universal subbundle, a universal quotient bundle. You can take quotients, uh, sorry, you can take uh, churn classes of these things and you get lots of interesting cohomology classes. You can do similar things on MGN bar. It doesn't give you everything, but it gives you, it gives you a kind of nameable part of the, of the cohomology ring. Uh, and, and maybe the, the best way, the, the way that I, I, I like to think about this for myself is uh, asking if something lies in the tautological ring is a, a way of asking, could anyone ever write down a formula for it in some vague sense, okay? Um, uh, and of course, that means that, that you, you should also ask, can you actually write down a formula for a class? Uh, okay. Um, good, okay. So, but maybe uh, the, 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 the part of the geometry that I find more interesting is, is there's this product rule that you know looks like it should hold, right? A map to P1 cross P1 maybe should be two maps to P1. Uh, and, and I wanted to understand, I still, uh, uh, yeah, maybe to some extent, I still want to understand why exactly this product rule is failing and, and, and how it's failing. So, so can it be corrected uh, in some way? And there, okay, there are lots of other, there are lots of other uh, questions along these lines. Um, okay, so I've put two warnings here for myself. Uh, okay, no, this one maybe I addressed. Uh, the one on the left, so, um, uh, these these kinds of questions, maybe I'll just take a moment to say, uh, these kinds of questions about does the does this class lie in the tautological part of cohomology are part of a, a, a larger story. So there's a there's a speculation slash conjecture of Levine and Pandari Pandey where uh, they ask, you know, do all classes from Gramov Witten theory, do all classes that come in the moduli space of curves that come from Gramov Witten theory, do they lie in the tautological part of cohomology? Um, and uh, and the answer to that is is still open. And 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 for example, um, I think. Yeah, with what I'll tell you today, the, the case of surfaces at least doesn't seem so far away. Okay, um, all right. So I'm gonna have to shift gears uh, to tell you about some other stuff now before I can carry on. So maybe now is a good moment for me to pause and ask if there are more or any questions. Cool. <sighs> okay, so... Um, what I'm going to do in the remaining time that I have is to tell you how to fix this, okay? So I'm, I'm going to try to explain what we found, there's something kind of curious here, about how to fix this failure of a product rule, okay? So there's some, uh, there's some statement on the interior of the moduli space of curves that's true, namely that, you know, one, 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 one cycle class is a product of two other cycle classes in cohomology, uh, and it fails on the boundary, and I want to tell you why it fails and how it fails and how to fix it. Uh, and in the process, we'll we'll end up answering at least one of these, maybe a couple of these questions here. Okay, but in order to do that, I need to take a take a, a detour and tell you a little bit about these um, uh, these things called Artin fans, which are very popular uh, in my friend group these days. Uh, so, uh, okay, so so I don't know to what extent this is uh, this is new for any of you, but 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 let me say it. So. Um, Okay, so I'm, uh, the, the starting point is this is this al algebraic stack that, that's called A1 mod GM, okay? So it is exactly what it looks like. A1 is a, is a perfectly good algebraic variety. GM is a group, uh, it's a multiplicative group, it acts on it, and I can take a quotient. Uh, there's a question of where I wanna take this quotient. Uh, maybe I wanna be intelligent about how I take the quotient, uh, but, but there is a good way to do this, and, and you can take it in the world of algebraic stacks, art and stacks. Uh, so I have no idea what this actually is. I don't, you know, I probably don't even really know what an art and stack is. If I'm honest with myself, uh, but I know, but but I know how to name a map from an algebraic variety to A1 mod GM, 
And I name a map from this algebraic variety x to a1 mod gm by giving you a Cartier divisor on x. Okay, so that's just exactly the data. a1 mod gm is a moduli space, a map to it is a Cartier divisor on x. If I'm being really honest, uh, maybe it's a, it's a pair of a line bundle and a section of that line bundle. Okay, uh, so this is probably, uh, if this seems un unfamiliar, it's probably more familiar than you think it is. Uh, namely, that if I told you uh, that I gave you a principal divisor on um, uh, on an algebraic variety, then that's the same thing as a function. It's a, that's, a, that's a map to A1. Uh, and that function is well defined up to, um, uh, up to a constant. And so it, it, it gives you a map to A1 mod GM. Okay, but, but more generally a map to A1 mod GM is a Cartier divisor that's not necessarily principal. <sighs> okay, so um, similarly, if I wanted to give you not just a Cartier divisor, but a Cartier divisor and a way of writing it as a sum of other uh, Cartier divisors, um, I, I get, a, uh, a map from X to this, this stack AK mod GM to the K, okay? So th these are all tautologies. These are you know, essentially by definition. Um, I, I don't know how else to name a map to AK mod GM to the K uh, other than giving you this data. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's where we are. These are just some kind of tautological objects and, uh, and they're related to tropical geometry in a way that is becoming increasingly uh, clear due to the work of many, many people, uh, especially this guy, Martin Ulrich. Okay, uh, so the, the moduli space of tropical curves is, uh, is a parameter space for, yeah, it's, it's, it's a moduli space for tropical curves. So what is a tropical curve? Maybe you've seen a definition before, but, um, but, but uh, you know, I'll take a very practical definition, which is I'll take, um, I'll, I'll take any dual graph that arises from a stable curve, Okay, so namely, I, I take a stable curve and I record its topological type by putting a vertex down for every, uh, for every irreducible component and an edge between two of those uh, vertices whenever they meet. Uh, and I get, I get a collection of graphs these way, this way. And the, um, uh, the moduli space, of, okay, a tropical curve is just some way of turning that into a metric space. Okay, so, so for example, if I, uh, you know, if, 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 I, if I look in the moduli space of curves and I see some graph, uh, some dual graph that looks like this, a tropical curve for me is just the data of adding, uh, okay, it's a terrible color, okay, of adding some edge lengths, three, two, uh, and four to those things, and that determines a point of the tropical moduli space, okay? So this is really like a, a very discrete combinatorial uh, object, uh, okay? So, so the moduli space of tropical curves is stratified, just like the mo moduli space of ordinary curves is, uh, of, of, of smooth curves is stratified. It's stratified into what are the different graphs that could show up? Uh, and it's built by saying, okay, if I fix a graph, uh, the way of building, uh, the, the way of parameterizing um, uh, the different ways that I could turn that graph into a metric space is essentially just given by the data of choosing an edge length for each graph. Right? So, so if I have a graph, I can turn that into a tropical curve just by, um, by, by choosing an edge length for each graph. And therefore it's parameterized by this cone, um, which is yeah, R positive to the number of edges. So it's a very simple thing. Uh, and when I set edges equal to zero, some graphs become other graphs, right? So, so if, I have a, if I have a graph like A, and I set one of the edge lengths, maybe that edge length uh, equal to zero, I end up with a graph that looks like this instead, okay? So there are, uh, there are, natural, um, uh, there are natural identifications of faces of, um, of cones that, that parameterize graphs with, with smaller graphs, okay? Uh, okay, so in the moduli space of curves, it's essentially glued from these things. And so if you want to be fancy, you can write that as a co-limit of, of cone sigma sub g, where g ranges over some set of graphs, okay? So uh, hopefully there are people here that are familiar with, I don't know, fans of toric varieties. And so uh, it's, it's very similar to how you construct the fan of a toric variety. You take some collection of cones and you glue them together along certain uh, inclusions of faces, okay? So you, it's, it's a co-limit of some diagram of cones. Uh, okay, so what does this have to do with the thing I said before? There's a swindle that we like to perform in this, uh, in this subject, uh, which is that you take every single cone, which is just, remember, this is just kind of Rn uh, positive. Uh, you take every, every cone that you see and you replace it with uh, one of these, uh, what we call Artin fans, so An mod GM to the N, right? which as I said before, is not an object that you should be uh, particularly afraid of. It's, it's, a, it's a perfectly reasonable object. Uh, and, um, uh, and yeah, okay. So so what that means is that there's some kind of sister. So you know, the MGN trop is is a purely combinatorial object. You should think of it as a fan of some toric variety. And just like uh, okay, so so um, 
there, there's some sister object to this, uh, to, to this, this fan-like object, uh, which, is, uh, which is a zero-dimensional Artin stack that's called the Artin fan. Okay? So, and, and it's really built in exactly, okay, it, 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 what I've written is actually essentially precise. Uh, so if I glue together a collection of cones, I can, I can associate to that an Artin stack by gluing together a collection of zero-dimensional Artin stacks. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, and then the tautology, essentially the same tautology that, that, I, that I wrote up here, uh, translates into a statement that MGN bar comes with a canonical map uh, to this, okay, to not, not quite the tropical moduli space, but some kind of, you know, Artin stack version of the, of the tropical moduli space called the Artin fan. Okay. Okay, so, so where is any of this going? Um, uh, oh, yeah, I have some examples. Just in case you've not constructed the, the if, if you've never seen a construction of the tropical moduli space, here are two simple examples. Uh, the, the tropical moduli space M04 looks like this tripod here uh, because there are four types of stable graph. Sorry, yeah, I guess three types of stable graphs that really appear. Um, uh, and uh, once I fix a type of stable graph, I can choose an edge length uh, and this positive, uh, you know, this positive real line here uh, parameterizes that edge length. And I can do that in three different ways. When I set the edge length equal to zero, I end up at the same point, namely a vertex with four uh, legs sticking out. Okay, so hopefully that's vaguely familiar. Uh, M12 trop kind of looks similar. Uh, what you see here is just a, a way of keeping track of all of the different stable dual graphs that show up when you think about the moduli space of curves, and um, uh, yeah, and they glue together in a natural way. Okay, and so what we're really saying here with this Artin fan business is that this translates. You know, there's some there's some way of turning this into into an object of algebraic geometry. So, uh, namely, one of these uh, one of these Artin fans. Okay. Okay. So, where does any of this get us? Uh, well, as I said before, the um, where am I going? Sorry. Uh, yeah. As I said before, the the cohomology of the moduli space of curves is a is a kind of uncontrollable object. Especially the Chow cohomology of the moduli space of curves is is extremely difficult to understand. Um, However, any time I have a map from from it to something uh, something that's potentially simpler, you can you get a supply of cohomology classes in the moduli space of curves using using this thing over here. Right? So if I can map you know any variety to an algebraic variety that I understand well, I can pull back cohomology classes uh, and therefore get an interesting supply of classes on on the moduli space of curves, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. Okay, so. Uh, there's this, this tautological ring. It's defined in lots of different ways. I'm not quite going to give you a definition, but I'm going to give you lots of classes in this ring uh, in a purely combinatorial fashion. Okay? And the way we're going to do it is, is by saying, okay, um, this, uh, this, this, this thing, which is an Artin stack, and, and again, I don't really know what that is. It's just some formal object that this maps to. Uh, this, uh, there's this Artin stack, and MGN bar comes with a natural map to this, uh, to this object. Okay? And, 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 and it's as much of a tautology once you un once you understand what's going on, it's as much of a tautology as a Cartier device. You're giving you a map to, MG, uh, to A1 mod GM. It's really the same level of, um, yeah, it's the same phenomenon. Um, and so there is a there is a pullback map from the cohomology of AGN to the cohomology of of MGN. And remember, this is just some gadget that I constructed out of the tropical moduli space. Okay, so it's a fact that was uh, that was used by Molho Sam Molho, my co-author, and and Rahul Pandurai Pandey and Johannes Schmidt. To um, yeah, it was a fact that was used by them to construct interesting uh, tautological classes on the moduli space of curves by pulling back classes from here. Okay, uh, so hopefully, okay, so hopefully it's clear that this is a simpler object, right? I constructed it using completely combinatorial information, so it should be simpler. Um, and and actually, um, one of the things that Sam and I proved along the way uh, in this project was was to completely characterize what this what this thing is. Okay, so there's um, okay, so so AGN, as I said, is some zero-dimensional Artin stack. It's some object that maybe uh, is is uh, feels a little bit mysterious, but its cohomology ring has a completely combinatorial uh, interpretation as the ring of piecewise polynomial functions on the moduli space of tropical curves. Okay, so so maybe I should explain this a little bit. Um, so probably everyone. Um, okay. So okay. So so probably it's clear that uh, that uh, a cone, right? Just just an ordinary, uh, you know, a cone in a vector space has a good notion of of linear function, right? Namely the functions that are linear on it, uh, continuous functions that are linear on it. Uh, as a consequence, you know what a piecewise linear function is on a cone complex because it's just something. It's a continuous function that should be linear on each cone, and then a ring of piecewise polynomial functions is just exactly the same thing. It's, it's, it's the ring of continuous functions that are kind of locally products of linear functions. Uh, okay. 
So, um, okay, so, so, so in fact, uh, any of these Arden fans that show up a lot in this, uh, in this, in this world, their, their cohomology is completely controlled by this, uh, by this ring of piecewise polynomial functions on some tropical object. Okay, so, so this, this builds on work of lots of other people, uh, Brion and, and, and Payne, Sam Payne in particular, um, studied this in a toric context. Okay, uh, so what's going on? Well, we, there, there's this, you know, back, back uh, uh, you know, several moons ago, I explained that there was this phenomenon that I want to try and understand, that there's a product formula that seems like it should hold um, uh, concerning the double ramification cycle, you know, cycles of, of um, cycles parameterizing curves that emit a map to P1 and curves that emit a map to P1 cross P1, right? So that was, that was uh, where we were. And to understand the failure, we're going to need this ring. Right? We're going to need this ring of piecewise polynomials. And, uh, and so, so using this and using some other techniques, what Sam and I are able to show at this point uh, is that this tautological ring uh, contains uh, these cycles from before. Okay? So the cycle of curves in MGN bar that admit a map to P1 cross P1 of a, of a certain type lie in the tautological part of the cohomology of the moduli space of curves. Okay? So, so again, I've not exactly told you what, what the tautological ring is aside from, um, uh, aside from telling you that, that Okay, maybe, yeah, aside from telling you that the ring of piecewise polynomial functions on this Artin fan actually gives you, um, uh, uh, actually gives you um, tautological classes. And in fact, what we show is, okay, essentially up to a small lie, this thing actually lies in the image of this, this pullback map on cohomology, okay? Okay, so, so I want to spend the remaining time, do I have remaining time? Yeah, okay. I wanna spend the remaining time talking about what the geometry is behind this failure. Uh, and maybe like like many instances, there's a, there's a very basic reason why this this product rule fails, and and uh, and it's it's essentially the following. Uh, so suppose that you were in the following. Okay, so now forget about the moduli space of curves, forget about toric contact cycles and all this stuff. Just suppose you had some some nice algebraic variety and you blew it up. And so you take any class, maybe even P two, and you and you blow up a point. Uh, then typically something that fails is that there's a push forward map. Right? So if I can take a cycle and, and push it forward, that push forward map is not a ring homomorphism. That, that's kind of a, I think that's relatively, uh, that's, rel that's a relatively obvious fact that push forward cannot be a ring homomorphism because you know, if, you, if you're mapping down, then it's easier for things to intersect in the image than to intersect in the, uh, in, in the place where they start. Okay? So push forward is not a ring homomorphism. And whatever is going on with this product rule, although it seems to fail on the moduli space of curves, the point is that it seems to hold on a blow up of the moduli space of curves and that blow up is informed to us by tropical geometry in a way that I will now try and explain, okay? So, so um, uh, okay. okay. So the, the route into this is, is to think about what you might call the tropical version of the double ramification cycle, uh, which, is, which is a very, yeah, it's a, it's a very, it's, it, it, yeah, it's a relatively uh, pleasant object to think about. So this is something that, that Renzo Cavalieri and Hannah Markvig and myself, um, yeah, first started thinking about maybe close to ten years ago now, um, uh, and 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 uh, Martin Ullrich and Dmitri uh, Zakharov have also written a paper on it quite recently. Uh, okay, so so what is it? It's it's essentially it's a, well it's it in some sense it's just the tropical version of the double ramification cycle problem. So so remember I started off with this information of a, a vector a one up to a n. Um, with uh, with the sum of AI zero, okay? So that's the discrete data that I start with, just like before. Uh, and inside MGN trop, which is just some space of graphs, right? That's really all it is. Um, I have a subset, an interesting just subset where I can ask a yes or no question, okay? Uh, I can ask, uh, you know, is, well, the, the way you should think about it is, is the sum of AI PI trivial? That's what we, that's the same question we asked before. Uh, and, and the way you can formalize this is by asking, does your graph admit a map to the real line where uh, the slopes of this, uh, okay, it's, it's, it should be a piecewise linear map, where the slopes of this piecewise linear map are given exactly by this input data, this input vector A, uh, and the map has to be continuous, right? So that's all. So, uh, okay, if you, if you don't think about tropical geometry on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe this seems a little, um, um, mysterious as to why one would do this. If you do think about tropical geometry on a day-to-day -day basis, this is like the first thing you try. Okay, so, so maybe that's the, the honest way of saying this. Um, so, so this subset dr, drg trop uh, 
of A is the subset where uh, you know, some natural tropical condition holds. And it's just the tropical analog of the double ramification cycle problem that I started off with, namely that some divisor uh, is trivial. OK, um, or linear equivalent to 0. So, so what does this look like in practice? Uh, well, it's actually, so, so I just want to, I want to maybe explain, you know, why, uh, you know, what, yeah, what, you know, how would you figure out what's in this subset and what's not in this subset? So for example, here, I've taken my vector A to be uh, these four numbers that hopefully sum to zero. Um, and here's, here's the graph. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in MGN bar, uh, sorry, I'm in MGM trop, and I want to figure out, does this graph belong to this subset or not, right? This is kind of a purely polyhedral geometry problem. Uh, so the way I do it is, is I first pick my graph that I want to analyze, and then I assign uh, I assign slopes. Okay, so I know this. Uh, so this this well, okay, uh, this uh, this leg over here uh, is maybe the it, it comes with a label. Maybe that label was zero. Uh, sorry, maybe that label was one. And so uh, so I put the four in front. Uh, so I'm going to try and construct my linear map, my piecewise linear map, uh, in steps. So uh, my piecewise linear map will have slope four along this leg. And then I assign the rest of the slopes essentially by using the balancing condition, namely that the, you know, if you think about this as, as water flowing, the input and output uh, should be the same. Okay, so I have four liters coming in and, and four going out. So there's some, there's some ways to do this. Uh, and you just assign slopes in such a way that the, you know, when you, when you fall out on the other side, that you see the three numbers that you expect. Okay, so, so this is a kind of assignment of edge lengths that I just cook up using this. It's a purely discrete procedure. Uh, and then you ask, what are the possible edge lengths that would have allowed such a map to be continuous. And, and, and the only thing I want to point out here is that it's a non-trivial condition, OK? The only thing that you should see from this is that it's a non-trivial condition. Why? Um, I'm trying to assign edge lengths to each one of these three edges. And in order for the map to R to be continuous, well, I mean, you know, they start and end at the same point. And so whatever this edge length is, it has to be equal to half of this edge length and half of this edge length. And those second two are equal. I mean, this is just some very basic, uh, you know, some very basic um, whatever uh, thing. So, so I solve for these edge lengths that allow this continuity relation. And I find that there's some interesting subset of, of in this case, M24 trop, right? This is a genus two curve with four marked points uh, where this edge length constraint holds. Okay. So, um, uh, so, so, yeah, this is this is just some very simple three-step procedure that outlines that, that, that yeah it picks out exactly uh, yeah it picks out exactly some subset of uh, MGN uh, trop that I'll call the tropical double ramification cycle. So at this point you're essentially just playing some game, right? This is some game of of are we uh, you know are, uh, there's a natural way of doing some things in in algebraic geometry and we're just kind of playing the game of you know does that make sense in a purely combinatorial world? And it seems to pick out some some subset. Uh, with 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 a non-trivial condition. Um, okay, so what does this subset actually give you? Um, well, just like in toric geometry, a subset, you know, a, a subcomplex of a fan. Right? Uh, um, if I if I take a fan and I yeah, if I take this fan here, for example, and I subdivide it, right, and I take that subcomplex, what does that tell me? That that essentially tells me the data of a blow up or maybe an open subset uh, of a blow up, right? So so this is hopefully familiar. And therefore, this tropical analog, right? I have no reason to expect this, but this tropical analog seems to be telling me to go and look at a certain blow up of the moduli space of curves, right? So, so here I've done it. Uh, in, my picture is in an even simpler case here, where I'm on M12 trop, and maybe my slopes are are two and and minus two. So my vector a is two comma minus two. Uh, and then I can ask myself in this cone, right? This, this is a two-dimensional cone that parameterizes the edge lengths L1 and L2, uh, which, which turn this, this graph into a metric space in lots of different ways. And I can ask which one of those metric spaces actually admits a piecewise linear map to the real line where the slopes are two and then, okay, the one, one, and then minus two going up. Okay. So I can just ask that yes or no question. And of course, the same analysis that we did before tells me that, well, I, have to, I really have to live on the diagonal. In order for this to have any chance of being a continuous map, right? So, so I have to live on the diagonal, and I get this subset, um, which yeah, the subset in in blue uh, that I've that I've drawn here. Okay, and what is the subset in blue? Well, if this was a toric variety, you'd see this, and you'd say, ah, what you did was you took a two, you blew up a point, and maybe okay, because I'm only taking the blue part, you throw away the 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 fixed points and the exceptional divisor. Okay, so and but the the point is somehow that just like in toric geometry, we're being told 
by some purely combinatorial problem, how to blow up uh, the moduli space of curves in some interesting way. And so the theorem, which really maybe should be called a recipe that, that, Sam, uh, that Sam and I prove, are that you can calculate these toric contact cycles in the following kind of four-step procedure. So you start off with the purely tropical problem. You construct the, you know, so you're given, you're given vectors uh, A1 and A2 that tell you your ramification data. Uh, and you, you first construct the, the tropical version of the double ramification cycle problem for A1 and for A2, which we've done before. And then you just intersect them in a purely combinatorial fashion, right? So there's nothing algebra geometric about that. You just intersect them in a purely combinatorial fashion. And that tells you an open subset of a blow up in the moduli space of curves, which I've, which I've uh, used this tilde to denote. Okay? So I blow up accordingly and I take some open subset. And then the key somehow is that um, what you have to do is take the original cycles that you thought would work, the original cycles that you thought would, uh, would give you uh, this TC thing. And you have to take their strict transforms, okay? And there's a lot of kind of virtual structure, virtual geometry here. So you have to take something fancy or called a virtual strict transform, but whatever, that's, that's maybe not the point. Um, okay, so, so this way you end up with two cycles on a blow up of the moduli space of curves. You can intersect them up there and then you can push forward. Right? So this is the procedure. So you solve some tropical problem. The tropical problem tells you a blow up. You move to the blow up by a strict transform procedure and then you intersect there and push forward. And so how does this differ from actually just intersecting these two cycles before blowing up and you know, doing the naive thing? What, what Sam and I show is that they differ exactly, um, uh, they, they differ exactly by, by classes on this tropical moduli space, namely piecewise polynomials, okay? So that gives us some handle on what this uh, intersection theory problem, this, this intersection theory problem is. So this virtual strict transform is a slightly subtle object. Um, we, uh, we have to be a little careful in working with it, but but nonetheless, we're able to control it using some, some, some relatively pretty uh, techniques. In, in particular, maybe the heart of the analysis is done by um, a formula of Alufi for, for segre classes of, of monomial schemes, which, uh, which I really recommend looking at if, you, if you've never heard of it. Uh, okay, so, so this is not somehow the end of the story. What would be really nice is, uh, is if this was, um, uh, if, is if this was, um, a, a, a way to get a clean formula for this for this cohomology class, but we're not uh, we're not there yet. In some sense, we're we're quite far uh, from there. Um, it seems to be an instance of a much more general phenomenon that that's happening, namely that that there is um, there is a ring uh, that that one might call the logarithmic Chow ring of the moduli space of curves. So a lot of a lot of people have thought about this, including um, you know Lawrence Barrett and Leo Herr and David Holmes and Rosa Schwartz and various other people. Um, where they seem to be understanding that, that um, this object, which is not just the cohomology ring of the moduli space of curves, but where you take blow ups of the moduli space of curves, which induce injections on, on rings by pullback, and you take essentially the union, the co-limit of all of these things, uh, that gives you some kind of slightly crazy ring analogous to something called the polytope algebra uh, in, in combinatorics. Uh, and um, and that ring seems to be something really fundamental. So 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 the kind of highbrow way of looking at this uh, four-step procedure that, that Sam and I uh, write down is that it's really one instance of a calculation in this logarithmic cohomology ring, okay? And in a, in a way that maybe we don't understand as well uh, as we would like. Uh, okay, so so maybe I'll just, uh, before before ending, I'll just say, you know, wh where does this story go from here? Uh, one consequence that, that you know, seems very much within reach uh, are statements along the lines of, of this conjecture of Levine and Pandare Pandey that I mentioned earlier, that uh, for instance, this should, this should give us enough to prove that the, um, that the virtual fundamental classes of moduli spaces of stable maps to the surfaces are all, they all lie in the tautological ring of the moduli space of curves, uh, which is, um, yeah, just one dimension up from what we currently know. Uh, and this is some of the key, uh, the, the key new ingredient. Uh, okay, so, um, I told my version of the story, but uh, there are lots of other people that are thinking about this. So, so I encourage you to, to take a look at their work if, if you're interested in them. I've written some names here. Um, um, my, own, uh, my own understanding of the subject was helped a lot by this, this paper with, uh, with Navid from, um, yeah, I don't know, sometime in the pandemic, uh, uh, where we saw some similar phenomena uh, in a more kind of more Gromov Whitney context. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say, and I will stop now.